program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. teach you options trading inside and out basic to complex this is options boot camp brought to you by sogo trade an extraordinary value in online trading why pay more for the same trade when sogo trade can deliver for less options commissions are just five dollars per ticket and 50 cents per contract and just three dollars for stock and etf trades open a new account today and receive 100 free trades Visit www.sogotrade.com to learn more about all our free trading tools, educational resources, and other resources available to you to enhance your trading experience. Remember, options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. For more information, please read the characteristics and risks of standardized options available at www.sogotrade.com. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Boot Camp Drill Instructors, Mark Longo, Dan Passarelli, and John Critchley. All right, and welcome back to Options Boot Camp. This is, of course, the program where we take you, the raw options recruit, and we break you down and build you back up into seasoned options veterans my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from the ever expanding ever exciting ever educational options insider radio network and if you haven't had a chance to check it out lately i encourage you to check out our new programs on the network of course we launched options news rundown a few months back with our own dan passarelli from this program check it out it's a great daily look into the breaking headlines and latest news from the world of options and just a few weeks ago we launched our latest edition to the network the wide world of options where our friends over at the options industry council take you on a very broad view into the world of options what's trading strategies analysis education interviews the whole nine yards even some nostalgia and some book reviews and all kinds of fun stuff so check it out the wide world of options and options news rundown and all the other fine programs on the options insider radio network available on the options or on your podcast provider of choice itunes stitcher aha mobile wherever you get our stuff wherever you listen to podcasts we're there all right and joining me on the program as always my two black hat companions the proverbial yins if that's the plural, to my yang. Starting off with the man from Frankfurt, Illinois, none other than Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. Passarelli, welcome back to the show, sir. Well, by golly, it's always great to be back, Mark and John. Um, very wonderful to be here. And speaking of John, we are also joined by our other boon companion, the Major Domo of options over there at SogoTrade.com. None other than Mr. John Critchley. John, welcome back to the show to you as well. Hi, everybody. Great to be back. Uh, another great topic today, and uh, we're looking forward to breaking it down for all our new recruits. Yeah, we do have a good one today because it's uh, something that's been percolating for a while in my head, and I'm glad we finally have a chance to get to it here on the show. So without further ado, let's dive right on into our basic training segment. All right, Boot, it's time to get in line. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. You're going to learn options trading inside and out, basic to complex. There will be no failures. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Pull in. Prepare to learn. Yes, sir. All right, and welcome to the basic training segment. This is, of course, the portion of the program where we take a basic option strategy and break it down and analyze it for the benefit of you, the Options Bootcamp listener. And today we're going to dive into something very interesting. We've 
had a lot of questions about this and, and variations on this strategy come into the website over the years. In fact, we had someone write into one of our other programs on the network about a similar strategy just last week. So I thought it was an excellent time to really dive deep into this topic here on the Options Bootcamp program because it is so suited to the topic of this show and to the audience of this program. Uh, there's a number, number of different terms you can use to describe this. You can call it perhaps an alternative income strategy, or you can call it perhaps a coverage straddle, whatever, whatever term applies for you, you can use. There is no hard and fast rule for this one. But we're talking about the point where a lot of people who are covered call traders, and I know there are a lot of you out there in the audience, start looking at ways to boost the amount of income that you're generating from that strategy. And this typically happens around now. We look at where we are in the marketplace. We're recording this show uh, in mid-June 2013 for those of you who are listening years down the pike. But uh, at this point, we're at high levels in the marketplace and people are volatility has come off dramatically over the past month or so. And people are looking for ways to really start squeezing a little more blood from that stone, which is typically when we start seeing questions about this strategy start rolling in, which is why we're looking at it today. So the, the covered straddle is essentially taking the covered call to the next level. In the covered call, you'll remember, listeners, you buy XYZ stock at 50, and perhaps you write the 55 call against it. So then you, have, you are covered, you get, collect that whole $5 worth of appreciation, the stock rallies to 55, and then you're out at 55, plus whatever you sold the call for. Let's say it was a dollar in this case. So you're out at 56 collectively with the call premium, and you can keep doing that again month after month to maximize the decay all the things you've talked about on this show in the past. But there comes a point in every covered call writer's life when they start saying, hmm, what else can I do to jazz up this uh, this strategy, get a little bit more income? And that's when they start looking across the call, to the option chain to the put. And they're saying, you know, that put's just sitting there. And if I'm writing this covered call, why shouldn't I also perhaps write this uh, this other side of it, the put? And that's where we get into some very interesting waters. Let's start with you, Dan. I know you probably have a lot of clients who've come to you over the years who've gone through this progression. They started off as covered call traders, and then they start looking kind of hungrily over there at that put. Uh, what do you say to your clients and your customers when they reach this level of progression? You know, it's funny. It kind of depends on the the specific customer that I have. Um for example, I was I was doing a presentation in Texas last month, and forgive me if I told this story in our last episode, but uh, it, it's it's kind of telling. It was interesting. The, there were two presentations back to back, one one night and one the following night. Now the first night was a group of option traders, and I stood before them and I told them, you should never sell naked puts. It just doesn't make sense for you as a trader. There's too much risk reward. You're kidding yourself when you when you say that you um, you want to own the stock if it falls below that level. You're a trader. You don't want. You're an option trader. You don't want to own that stock. You know. You're you're just making up excuses to give yourself an excuse to sell a naked put, which you shouldn't be doing. And then the second night, it was a group of investors, and my comments to them were. Yeah, selling naked puts that are secured by cash is a fantastic investment strategy. <laughs> it's a really great idea, you know, it, especially if you're looking to uh, maybe buy a stock and, you know, get assigned if the stock falls. It's a great entry into a stock and it's a great way to generate income. So, you know, I basically said the exact opposite things to both of these groups and I meant them to each of those groups because they're very, very different categories of people. I think traders are not really so well served to selling puts. There's better ways to do it. Selling put spreads, just sell twice as many. You know, you have the same profit potential and a fraction of the risk. But if you're an investor using options and maybe you are looking as for an entry into a stock potentially or to generate some income or maybe both, I think uh, selling puts can be a really, really excellent strategy for sure. So you're saying selling the puts as in adding them to the covered call, adding an additional put leg, uh, which is what we're talking about here. Yeah, well, right, exactly. I mean, I was just kind of being a little bit general of selling puts in general. But, um, you know, when you when you add it to a covered call position, you're adding a really a potentially really interesting dimension. You know, you're you can look at it. I mean, you can kind of break it down a number of different ways, but look at it as just kind of doing the same thing as having that covered call, but 
putting up plus capital, not shelling out as much for the stock. You know, there's different margin abilities, and I imagine we can get all, into all that as we uh, progress through this discussion. John, we'll get your take on this as well when someone approaches you with this, and we'll maybe walk through some examples of some specific use cases for this and some drawbacks and benefits to taking the coverage straddle approach. Yeah, this Dan really hit on the on the main point, and it was very well stated. Um, this, you know, the number one strategy for the beginning option trader is the covered call strategy. It's very simple to understand, and it's for the you know the investors that are more long term and want to add some income. And the, the covered straddle is just a way when these when these when my customers get more get more knowledge or they get more uh, used to or comfortable with options that we come to them or, or I tell them, hey, maybe you can try this straddle out. Now we know, and we're gonna get in later in the podcast, that the cover straddle is equivalent to being short uh, two puts. However, uh, for the again, for the guy who's just started out the retail customer that's comfortable with the covered calls, this is easy, this is a great way to ease them into you know producing more income without telling them, well listen, all you really need, all you should really do is just sell two puts. So it's a great strategy for the, the, these retail customers, more long-term oriented. And Dan really hit on the, the difference between the retail long-term and more the, the traders. So let's walk through then that proverbial coverage straddle example. We talked earlier about XYZ, my favorite stock. I know John and Dan's as well. We've all, we've all made and lost fortunes in good old XYZ. Let's say you're long XYZ from about 53 where it's trading right now, and you're looking at selling the 55 call, which is trading about 50 cents. And you're like, well, 50 cents, that's not bad. I can get the $2 of appreciation plus the 50 cents, 250, that's not bad. But what else can I do? I really want to squeeze a little bit more blood from this stone. You look over at the put wing, and now the 55 put, remember the stock's trading 53, so in this example, that put has $2 worth of intrinsic value it's two dollars in the money plus there's the 50 cents of extrinsic value that's floating around on that strike that is of course the value of the call so that put is trading for two dollars and fifty cents now you say wait a minute i can sell the call by itself for 50 cents or i can sell the call for 50 cents plus the put for two dollars and fifty cents and now i'm selling this straddle for three dollars and that becomes a much more attractive proposition very obviously for a lot of people because, hey, $3 is much larger than $0.50. Cents. So the immediate benefit of this strategy is readily apparent in that you're collecting a lot more immediate income. And for a lot of people, that's really, really attractive because you're in this, after all, to generate income, to generate an additional dividend stream on your stocks. So if you can juice it up by five or six times, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty attractive. Now, obviously... We've talked many times on the show about how there is no free lunch from an options perspective. And in reality, that's the case here. You're not going to get five, six times the amount of money for no additional risk. <laughs> and that's where the drawbacks of this strategy come in. You remember, as we said before, that when you sell, whether it's a naked short put or a cash secured put, whatever you want to term it, whatever approach you take, uh, you're really just working effectively another limit buy order in the stock so in this scenario you're along the stock you're writing the call now you're also writing an in the money put against that and the immediate risk additive nature of it the immediate drawback to that is also apparent you're selling an in the money put in this example so you're if all else holds equal that stock expires right where it is you're going to be assigned on that put you're going to buy an additional amount of stock in whatever proportion you choose to write that straddle so now let's say you're along 100 shares of xyz you do this straddle one time now you're buying another 100 shares of XYZ. You've just doubled your position. So that may not be something you want to do. Of course, you can close out that put wing as you get closer to expiration. But in this example, maybe you make the 50 cents. You'll keep the 50 cents of everything else in this example. Hold steady on the put as well as on the call. So that would be a decent return, $1. But in the risk additive portion of the equation, you're now adding an entirely new, essentially naked short put to the equation. And let's start off with that because remember we did a show a few months back called The Joy of Synthetics. And John just hit on that. Maybe I'll let Dan run with it a little bit more. But essentially what you're doing in this, if you remember our synthetics, covered call is synthetically equivalent to a naked short put. So now you've written a short put already with this covered call. Now you're tacking on another short put to it 
guess what you've done? You've just written two naked short puts, essentially, on that same strike. Uh, so from a risk perspective, you can clearly see where I'm going with this. It is a very risk-additive approach to the covered call. Dan, what's your take on the risk perspective of this? You're going from essentially being short one naked put to now being short two on the same strike. Right, exactly. You you hit it right on the head, Mark. I mean, it's synthetically, it's it's basically the same position, you know. But a lot of people, a lot of traders and investors, kind of look at it a little bit differently, and you know, that's kind of one of the things that I encourage my students always to do, is to look at their positions a number of different ways. You know, it's kind of like I say when you're buying a car, like you don't just look at the side of it and say, "I'll take it." You know, you look at all the sides of it, you look inside it, you look under the hood, you know, you kind of get a feel for the whole thing. And it's the same thing with this position. What it what it is, is it's a you sell a straddle and you own stock against it. But it's also a covered call with a short put. But it's also effectively two short puts, one actual, one synthetic. And just from an education standpoint, especially if you've never traded this sort of thing before, when you think about it in those terms, to me, it just makes you understand it so much better. Like, oh, yeah, OK, now I get it. And, you know, you, you carve out the risk looking at it each of those three different ways. And then, I don't know, I, I've just found when I was learning options 87 years ago and some of the students that I teach options to, it just seems to click a lot better when you when you approach it from the different angles that you can, you know. Now, John, you're traditionally the the margin guy here on the show for us. You you know all the vagaries of margin. Uh, you deal with it on a daily basis. You of course have all those great margin tools you created over there at SogoTrade.com for your customers. Now, so there's a tendency for a lot of our listeners out there to think of this, like we said, as a free lunch. But of course, there's the risk component. But also, you're adding essentially a naked short leg to your covered call now. The covered call, remember, it's called covered because you're covered by stock. So there's no additional risk component there from your brokerage perspective. Your stock gets called away. Uh, you have you have the stock to back it up. So that's covered. But now you're adding a completely uncovered leg. So people are looking at this saying, wow, that's free money. I'm hitting that put. I'm going to add that $2.50 to my account. That's just free money. When in actuality, you're generating now a new naked short leg. So what's that going to do to your position uh, from a margin requirement when you are when you see customers coming in and taking this approach uh, with this covered straddle versus the covered call? Sure. The margin is going to basically with um, if you have a true optimization in, in, in the margin for your positions, the, the naked put that you put on by doing this trade uh, is going to be margin at 20 percent of the underlying uh, stock price minus any out of the money amount. So let's say it's at the money. So it's going to be 20% of the underlying amount. Now, the one reason why selling the puts, the two puts, it might be a better strategy is because if you do a covered call, you're required to put up more than 20% of the money. So we can get into that later or maybe a different episode. But the bottom line is that customers have to really understand that, you know, margins are a very tricky thing. And to fully understand that we have a section on our website that goes over different strategies and a different margin required. Um, but with this strategy, it would be broken down into a covered call and then to the short put. And that's an important thing to, to really stress for our listeners is that you're not just adding this additional income stream to your account by selling this put component you're also tying up additional capital because you remember you're now adding a naked short leg to this covered trade. So your broker is going to reserve additional capital to cover the margin for that trade. So now all of a sudden you may find yourself having tied up a lot of a capital that was free uh, in order to potentially collect this income down the road. So you may find yourself not being able to trade other trades because margins being tied up to offset this new naked short leg that you've added. So there is an opportunity cost uh, to this trade, which is what I want to get to when I say there is no free lunch. And you're not just getting that extra free $2.50. There are There is additional risk, of course, and there's additional cost of opportunity in terms of tying up a lot of your capital. You may not have enough capital to do this, uh, depending on what you have in your account. Uh, so there may be uh, some restrictions you may not have thought of when you first started to think about this type of trade. Now, 
as I said, a lot of these questions start coming in around this time when volatility is low, the market has rallied extensively, um, people are looking for additional ways to kind of jazz up an additional and generate an additional income stream. Uh, but as we've seen, there's additional risk you're generating from this. There's additional margin requirements from this. Uh, what we like to see people, if they are going to take this approach, uh, is to keep in mind what we've said on this show in the past, that you always want to try to spread off that risk whenever possible. Uh, so let's say in this scenario, perhaps you're selling your socks at 53, you're selling the 55 call and the 55 put. Uh, but now because, of course, uh, you're worried about this, uh, this position suddenly, uh, suddenly perhaps going the way of the dodo, you want to add a kicker to that. So in case this, uh, this stock does turn around and go south, you might want to add perhaps, let's say, the 50 put as a bit of a kicker to hedge. Now you have a put spread, a short put spread instead of a short put naked, uh, which will help you from a margin perspective. You might actually be able to trade more of those short puts because you have a, a kicker on the end of it. You're hedging your risks. So you have a maximum risk exposure. And it's just a better way to take this approach overall. Of course, when you're doing that, you're taking a short straddle and then a short, a long put wing. Essentially, you've, what you've done is a broken wing iron fly. Go back to our spread uh, spread show us or actually go back to our spreads with wings episode a few months back and we get into iron flies and iron condors and things like that and this is essentially analogous to that without one of the extra call components in this sense uh, so you start seeing how things get a little bit more complicated the second you start walking down this road uh, but it is interesting nonetheless now dan is that an approach you'd like to take with your students if they are going to do this if they try to spread off that risk let's say if they're selling the short put naked in this sense and they add the long put component if let's say perhaps they're short the stock they add the covered call comp or they buy the long call component to hedge their risk and essentially leg into a broken wing iron fly is that the approach you would take with something like this yeah i mean the one thing that i like to do with all my students and my own trading is two things one make sure I have limited risk in the sense of when I'm selling options and two, when I'm buying options, usually create a spread too, because I can usually have lower risk, you know, shell out less capital and um, have comparable upside potential. And, you know, by the way, also just to qualify when I say limited risk, selling a naked put technically has limited risk, but you know, the stock goes to zero. It's it's gonna feel like it's yeah. unlimited. Risk. I don't think anyone <laughs> wants that stock going to zero being their limiting factor. Yeah, but of course we've been talking about a lot about the risks and the downsides. There are some additional benefits to taking this type of approach. I'm thinking of a few off the top of my head, but I'll let John. I'll let you run first. Perhaps you'll 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 jump all over me and say the same thing I'm thinking of. Let's see if our brains are simpatico after having done this show for a while together, John. What are you thinking of for additional pros to this type of strategy? I just wanted to touch on something that you mentioned earlier, and I really want to hit to drive it home. This is actually an excellent alternative for the long-term stock investors. And, and what I mean by that is that if you're willing to buy IBM and you're willing to buy 200 shares of IBM, you have the cash and you have the um, – this is an alternative where you can actually put a position on where you only have to buy maybe 100 shares of IBM and you can put this cover straddle on. And that would, you know, that might be an alternative for you. You know, it's less cash outlay. You have to be very careful. I mean, there are some, there's some Greeks involved also. Maybe Dan might want to hit on them. Um, the time decay. Um, there's a volatility component. But this, this enables long-term investors to, you know, take that extra cash that they have available and maybe invest it somewhere else. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's a way for customers that, you know, want to buy 200 shares of an underlying but now, by doing this, you can buy 100, do a cover straddle, and then maybe use that extra extra money that's still available, and you can maybe invest it somewhere else. Yeah, it's not a bad approach. I know a lot of people have experimented with this type of covered straddle approach. In fact, our friends over the OIC who have done so much great research on a variety of options topics, including covered calls and collars and things like that. I know they they tested the idea of this type of approach, this coverage straddle approach, and studying it and presenting it to money managers as a way to increase the amount of income they were generating from just the covered call. And what they found is when they added that short put component to the covered call, the additional short put component, it really blew a lot of people's minds. And they couldn't 
these high-end, sophisticated money managers couldn't wrap their heads around the fact that they were going to be getting long, essentially double their stock position if things moved against them. And they didn't really respond too well to that. So the OIC kind of killed that research. So it didn't resonate with that audience. But for a certain select audience, perhaps some of these uh, stock investors we have in our audience who are looking to have a little bit, add a little bit more bang to their buck to their stock portfolio. This may be an interesting approach. One other pro I want to discuss is because this is a short straddle, it is useful in a number of different scenarios, including this could be essentially a covered straddle for for a short stock position as well. Let's say you're short XYZ stock. Remember, if you're short stock, you could short puts, and that would be essentially be the inverse of that covered call type position where you're buying the stock back and you're working a buy order to buy that stock back against your short stock. Of course, in that scenario, you could also turn around and sell the call. That would be the complete reverse of this and then turn around and buy a farther out of the money call to hedge it as the kicker. Then you've done a similar thing. You've legged into essentially a similar short, uh, short iron con. I'm sorry, a short iron fly, but just with a short stock position instead. So there, this is this is a very nuanced, very adjustable type of position. It can apply to a lot of different scenarios you may have with the underlying, whether you're long, whether you're short, this could apply to them. So it is a very versatile position in that sense. But just remember the things you've hit upon today, that if you're going to do this, if you are the covered call trader, that's where a lot of you will approach this from. If you're a long stock with the covered call, you're thinking about adding that short put component. Remember what we've hit upon today. You're adding essentially two short puts now is what you're doing. You're used to, you were short one put. Now you're going to be short two puts. So you could in turn just turn around and sell twice as many of the puts and not have to deal with any of the stock component if you want to talk about the efficient use of capital like we talked about before on this show. So there's that component. Uh, the additional income is obviously a pro. The versatility of the strategy applying to both long stock and to short stock is a pro. But there are some drawbacks. Of course, you're adding additional risk by essentially doubling the amount of sh puts you are short now on that strike. And when you do that, you're also adding additional margin requirements. You're tying up additional capital to do that. So in turn, you're costing yourself the opportunity cost of being able to allocate that capital to other trades elsewhere. So remember, if you're okay with all of that, you understand all of those risks, this may be an interesting strategy for you. Of course, you may want prefer to just short twice as many puts. Or you may prefer to just do something else. You can just do the covered call twice. Uh, you can do a lot of different things because I wouldn't recommend that. It's a lot of cash on the stock side you're tying up there as well. But there are a lot of different approaches to take with this. Just remember all the different pros and cons we've walked you through with the covered straddle. Yeah, M Mark, can I just jump in one quickly one thing? Sure, go ahead. Um, I, I just always try to be fair and, and you know with disclosure. And, you know, if you are knowledgeable and you have studied options and Dan had mentioned this and you have more experience in the option marketplace um, by doing I I would advise a customer even though we get less commissions to sell two puts the other this, this trade for the more advanced trader is is needlessly complicated in other words if there, there's an equivalence of doing this trade of course is selling two short puts and you're going to create less commissions less for us but I just want to be honest out there that uh, if you want to put this trade on and you understand the dynamics and what you're creating synthetically, uh, just put this sell two puts and you'll, you'll be lessening you'll, you'll be, it'll be less in commissions, uh, you know, for the customer. There you go, listeners. A broker recommending the less commission trade, but of course, it is the more efficient way to approach this. If you're putting this on naked from the beginning rather than just considering the short straddle with the long stock, short two puts. Definitely a preferable way to go because you're ending up at the same place anyway and you're using less capital to do it. All right, that's going to do it for us today on the covered straddle portion of the program. And now we're going to keep on rolling right into your segment, the mail call segment. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, and welcome to the Mail Call segment. This is, of course, the portion of the program where you, the listener, get your chance to sound off and chime in and join us here on the old boot camp program. First up, we have more of a, a comment, really, from uh, Ronald Yurovich. Uh, he writes in, I heard your podcast of the Options Boot Camp talking about straddle. That was one of our recent episodes. 
He says, I don't like straddles because I would have a gain on one side, but it didn't cover the loss on the other side. If you remember, listeners, this is exactly what we talked about on the straddle portion of the straddle episode of the program, how difficult it is to execute and exit straddles profitably because you have to close one side usually and then the other. And that's difficult for a lot of people to do successfully. Ronald goes on to say, I prefer straddle, I prefer strangles, but only when vol is high, like in 2008. On September 15th, I placed a trade on XOM after I got home from work that would be placed for the opening of the next day. I bought three Jan uh, 90 strike calls and I bought two Jan 9, I'm sorry, two Jan 45 puts. So he did it on a bit of a ratio. Uh, XOM was trading around $65 a share at the time. The next morning when the markets opened, I checked to see if my trades were placed and they were. I was watching Bloomberg around 11 a.m. and saw that XOM was trading around $58 a share, so it had dropped substantially. It sounds like it was a big mover for him. I went online, closed the put side for an 18% gain. Later, when I was at work, I received a text message that told me that my call side was in the money, so I went online and sold the call side for a 34% gain. Altogether, I made 42% in less than a day. Ron. Well, well done there, Ron. Uh, a good trade. Interesting. I wanted to bring this up for a couple of reasons. First off, we like to have our listeners uh, tout some of their winners. It encourages the rest of our, of our listeners to do it as well. But also, it's an interesting approach that he likes strangles better than straddles. And he likes buying strangles, but only when vol is high. Uh, that's not something we hear very often from a lot of the listeners of this network who tend to fall, particularly the more advanced guys, tend to fall on the short premium side of the camp and tend to sell when vol is high. Dan, what do you have? What comments do you have for our friend Mr. Ron here? It's kind of like saying, well, you know, I only like to shop when I don't have any coupons, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But um, somewhat facetious. I think everyone's familiar and comfortable with the fact that I'm a little sarcastic. Um, thank you. But um, I, I do appreciate what he's talking about. I mean, you know, it, it's it's hard to really to really say anything when you're talking about volatility without somebody being able to counter you and say you're wrong. <clears throat> what he's talking about, of course, is the difference between implied volatility and historical volatility in, in context, in syntax. Um, what you want to do is you want to buy straddles when implied volatility is underpriced. Now, I changed the nomenclature here just a little bit. I didn't say when implied volatility is low. I said when implied volatility is underpriced. Because there can be times when you could be looking at a, you know, some stock options and the implied volatility is 50 or 60, which is, you know, uh, higher than most implied volatilities of most names out there. But it might be underpriced in terms of how much the actual stock is moving, i.e. historical volatility um, or maybe some other criteria that I would use to analyze the volatility. So I think what our friend here is getting at is that he likes to buy straddles when the historical volatility is high. I'm, I'm putting some words in your mouth and maybe changing some things around here for you, but um, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. You, you know, you would want to buy straddles when the historical volatility is high or is expected to be high relative to implied volatility. The, the one thing that I want to mention um, about strangles, I actually very much like strangles because um, I like to play events. And if you have an earnings event or some big event, a lot of times the at the money straddle, especially in some high flying, high price stocks, the actual premium is so high that if there's a chance that nothing happens, you can get really hurt. So I like to go out, um, you know, four or five or six percent, whatever the straddle is implying, and buy a strangle. And that way, if nothing happens, I don't lose as much money. And if we happen to get a big outlier event or a big move, now the straddle would have made me more money, but I'm still going to make some decent money uh, with the strangle. That happened in Apple uh, a few months back. I think it was 5:30 or 5:20. I bought the uh, 5:50 call, 4:80 put uh, for $10 when the strata was much higher than that, and the strata actually went to $30. Now again, the strata went was a bigger gainer, but there's less outlay and less chance that if something goes wrong that you lose a lot of money. I like your interpretation there, Dan. I think that's a nice charitable one. I didn't take 
exactly the same the same uh, interpretation. I was thinking that he said looking at implied volatility being high, which is not typically when you want to buy. But an interesting your your point is well taken. That of course, from a historical perspective, that is when you want to get in when historical has been high and you think it might be high again, and the implied is relatively underpriced compared to what we've seen historically. Well, Mark, I'm in retail. I have to be nice to potential customers. <laughs> there you go. Ron can contact you for, uh, for more information about all of this. But, yeah, I think it's an interesting point to bring up. Uh, just uh, the straddles versus strangles argument is an age-old one. It's a bit of a religious schism in the options market. Some people prefer the more meat-on-the-bones approach of the straddle. Some people prefer the approach that John outlined of take the straddle, go to the extreme of it, and then buy the strangle, and then you're looking pretty good if there is that outlier move. There's a lot of different approaches to take to this. I would just caution a lot of our listeners, if you are like Ron, if you are taking it and buying strangles or straddles when implied volatility is very high, uh, it's usually a difficult road to hoe because that is usually opportunities like right before earnings, other times when you're really paying a lot of inflated fluff for that strangle or that straddle, and that makes it very difficult to break even on that type of approach. So if you are buying strangles or straddles, uh, then definitely, like we said in our earlier show, know your break-even point, know historical versus implied, so you can understand where your vol level is relative to recent historical volatility levels, so you know if you have a decent chance of this trade breaking even and a lot of other things that go into that analysis i encourage you to go back listen to our straddles episode again if you haven't um but yeah ronald for falling on the strangles part of the equation i can't argue with them they are they are a little bit uh, easier to manage for a lot of people certainly less from an outlay perspective that is attractive to a lot of people just know you need substantial moves in the underlying this xom trade he outlines it sounds like a bit of an outlier you're not having many 65 dollar stocks that are moving looks like a 10 to 12 handle range, uh, that's a pretty substantial move. So if you're looking for names like that, those are very infrequent, uh, which is why, again, when you're paying inflated levels of volatility, you need this type of underlying movement to really make it pay off. So keep that in mind when you're trading strangles or straddles. But <laughs> but in general, great comment there, Ronald. Glad to hear you're being successful in your strangle trading. Hopefully it keeps up. Just keep those delineations between historical and implied vol in mind. And while we're on the subject of volatility, historical and implied, it ties in very well to our next question here from Mr. Theodore Roland. He writes, To what do the hosts attribute the rise in popularity of the VXX ETF? How can an ETF based off the implied volatility of the SPX be such a popular product? Do you think retail traders should be using options on this product versus the actual VIX options? Well, this is a great, great question here, Theodore, and something I've been asking myself quite recently, actually, as well, as I've seen the numbers coming out of the VXX, and then depending on the day, it, it can be up to the number three exchange traded product by volume, which is absurd levels of volume for an ETF that is, like you said, based on the front month implied volatility of the SPX product. It's a very hardcore institutional type product. And to see an ETF based off the volatility of that product, uh, that's even somewhat more obtuse, one more step removed to be such a high volume product. Clearly that is resonating with a very large audience beyond the institutional crowd that it is aimed at. So there are a lot of retail traders in there playing amongst the VXX shares that are floating about, uh, which is both interesting and perhaps a little bit disturbing for us here on this program, because we know from experience us here at the website, John talking to his customers, Dan talking talking to his clients. A lot of people get pulled in by the VIX hype when they don't really understand what the VIX is and how it works. And that could be a dangerous thing. And I, I somewhat tend to lean on this side of the fence or VXX that there are a lot of retail floating around in that product who really don't understand what this thing is and how it really works. Dan, I know you probably have a lot of clients who trade VXX. What's your take on VXX, its popularity, its use by retail, and the options on VXX versus the VIX options themselves? The easy answer as to why it's so popular is because of brute marketing force. Um, because, well, VIX, the volatility index options that the CBOE has listed, I mean, they're not just popular because people woke up one day and said, oh, hey, I want to trade VIX options. You know, I mean, the CBOE markets the crap out of VIX options. Um, and then, you know, the VIX options kind of have their issue. I mean, there's not actually a security that's the 
underlying technically for it. I mean, the futures are effectively the underlying, but they're futures. So the VXX consequently became popular because now you can trade shares in effectively the VIX. Although, you know, it's all very convoluted. Unless you're a very, very advanced option trader, I tend to... I tend to have my, my students or beginners or intermediate shy away from that because, I mean, the VXX is a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. I think I've got the right number of derivatives there. You know, um, I think I might have talked about this several shows ago, but I mean, I had one student who had a very large portfolio. You know, it was, well, I mean, it's all relative, but it was a few million dollars, you know. And he wanted to hedge it. And he said, well, you know, I've been reading on the Internet about the VXX, and I want to hedge it with VXX options. And I said, well, you know, why don't you just use a put? He's like, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't really understand puts, but, you know, this guy on the Internet said VXX is the best way to do it. And you're just going to, you know, if you, if you don't have a mastery of just regular vanilla options, you have no business trading volatility options. You know, they're they're way more complicated. You know, that's something we've hit upon on this show in the past, and that is another age old debate in the options business hedging with the direct type of hedge, the put or put spread. I think a lot of us here on this show tend to fall into that camp versus the more indirect type hedge, which is the VIX call or the VXX call and things like that. And there's a lot of pros and cons to each. Perhaps we'll get into that on a future show, direct versus indirect hedging and the pros and cons of each. Uh, but I think you hit on a good point that is worth discussing right now, Dan. That is the performance of VXX versus the VIX itself. Remember, like you said, this is a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. And there already are a lot of people who bemoan the way that VIX performs as a direct quote unquote hedge to the S&P. In fact, we got a lot of email yesterday when uh, the market sold off at one and a half percent. And if you paid attention, listeners, you saw that the VIX cash also was down quite a bit on the day. So that's not the type of performance you want from a product that you're viewing as an inverse correlation as a hedge. So the VIX itself has its own performance problems. And then now you take that a step removed yet again to the VXX, take this derivative of a derivative of a derivative, and now you're really getting into some very deep waters in terms of correlation and how the VXX is going to perform versus the VIX versus the XPX and implied volatility itself. We have some hosts, one of our other programs who like to refer to the VXX as being predictably crappy. They say it doesn't really perform that well, but you can, you, if you can understand how it underperforms, you can still use it because it is predictable. But not the kind of thing that really builds a lot of confidence in a product. Now, John, I know you have a lot of people over at Sogo who use VXX and are contacting you about VXX and VXX options. Uh, what's your take on this whole debate of VXX performance versus VIX performance and whether you should use VX, VXX options or VIX options? I try to steer every customer. I, I usually tell them to run for the hills if they want to, want to trade VXX. I mean, the VXX, it tracks the 30-day, the VIX futures. And as you mentioned earlier, the, the, the VIX, it's underlined by pretty much nothing. I mean, it, it's a mixture of the, the VIX futures and some, some VIX swaps. It's very, as Dan said, very complicated and convoluted and hard for the retail customer to understand, but basically every month the they have to rebalance the the fund, the, the VIX fund has to get rebalanced, and they're forced to, to sell uh, the nearest month um, expiring contracts and buy the next dated contracts. Well, guess what happens? The the traders that take their side of these trades they know that, and there's a phenomenon called contag contango that I'm sure Mark you speak about a lot in some of your more advanced podcasts, but basically that um, that erodes the value of the VIX. I mean, over the last uh, two or three years, uh, the VXS is, X is down 95% or more. I mean, someone can check, and the VIX is only down maybe 65%. So again, if you if you're a short-term trader, if you uh, understand this. But as Mark said in his intro, this is a very good for the institutional or the more advanced traders where we understand it. But now it's happened as a retail customer has jumped in 
without understanding all the dynamics about this rolling and the and the rebalancing. And for a long-term investor, the VXX is a bad proposition. Yeah, actually, John, John laid out basically what we could turn into a rule for you. If this is the first time you've ever heard the word contango, don't trade VXX. You know, how about rule number two? If you don't know why the VIX futures are not the same as the VIX index, don't trade either of them. And, you know, hey, man, stick to those two rules and you should be a OK. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so we took a little bit of a roundabout approach to answering your question there, Ted or Theodore, but I think it merited it in this case. So to answer you, I guess, in more succinct fashion, uh, to what do we attribute the rise in popularity of VXX? Well, Dan hit on it. Of course, marketing has been a big factor in that. But of course, I think the VIX in and of itself Really, if you talk to people over at SIBO, and I have about this actually, uh, they have also been very surprised with the level of success of VIX as just a brand. In fact, they'll they'll mention to you if you ask them, kind of off the record, uh, they'll say SIBO is very much a VIX house now. The SIBO brand is very much secondary. The VIX has eclipsed anything else they've ever launched, and it really has succeeded any of their expectations they have. For whatever reason, the concept of the fear gauge CNBC hitting on it for years and it really kind of just, it kind of just penetrated with retail and in a way that no one ever anticipated. And so as a result, VXX is benefiting from a lot of that runoff effect from the popularity of VIX in and of itself. And that really has, uh, has helped VXX overall. And do we think retail traders should be using options on this product versus the VIX options? <sighs> I really have a hard time recommending anyone, hey, run off and jump into the VXX versus the VIX options. The one plus that I think tracks some people the VXX versus the uh, the VIX product is, of course, the VIX options are hedged with the future. So you have to get into the the vagaries of futures, which is an off-putting prospect for a lot of retail options traders. The VXX, it appears on the surface to be much more palatable. They can take it, put it in a securities account. They could trade shares versus futures. They could hedge their options with shares of an ETF. That is easier for them to wrap their heads around. They can put it all in their one securities account. That's a plus, but it all comes down to the end of the day, the relative performance of that underlying and whether it is the actual equivalent of the futures themselves and then the options on those futures. And at the end of the day, I really don't think it is. I think a lot of these people should not be using this product that are, and uh, they really probably should be looking at perhaps a more direct hedging approach like a put spread, or if they're a bit more sophisticated and they understand the vagaries and nuances of that product, looking at a more direct VIX exposure versus this third removed product that really is succeeding almost in spite of itself. <laughs> uh, so that's our take here on VXX. Good question there, Theodore. Last up, we have a question from Alex K. Uh, this is a good one for you, Dan, so I'll just toss it over to you. This is a, what is a risk reversal and when should a trader use this strategy? Sounds like someone's knocking on the door of market taker mentoring, Dan. Why don't you let them in? <laughs> sure. You know, it, it kind of depends on which trading floor you're on, but generally speaking, what most people consider to be a risk reversal is what you and I know and love is a collar. It's typically the way they're traded. When you own stock, you own an out-of-the-money put, and you're short an out-of-the-money call. That's that's um, what people are generally referring to when they talk about risk reversals. Now, you know, it's funny. I, I traded down on the floor of the CBOE, and I also traded on the floor of the Board of Trade, and it's, it's that that same phrase, risk reversal, means different things on different exchanges. And then once we get into, you know, regular trader land, not people down on the trading floor, um, you know, it could mean something different. But collar, that's basically what, what we're talking about here is a collar. And you would use that, of course, to protect a long stock position that you have. Hmm, simple answer. We could we have a whole show about that if we'd like to. But um, that's the basics. Yeah, I want to mention two um, questions that I get a lot, and the questions I get are people read about these risk reversals, and they say, you know, why trade them? And there's two simple reasons. One, they are a form of delta hedging, which we can get into maybe in a later podcast, but because the the, the way they're constructed, uh, selling the, the put 
and buying the core and vice versa. There, there's a uh, component of um, Delta there, but also um, the way I like to use them sometime. And when I was a trader, and maybe Dan and Mark, this the same way, is something that we call skew. If we see that, or if I see that the skew, which means the implied volatility of the of the puts, is much higher than than the uh, implied volatility or the calls or vice versa, then there's there's a, there's an opportunity there to take advantage of the skew and maybe sell the puts that are very high in implied volatility terms and buy the calls or vice versa. So it can be either used for delta hedging or to take advantage of some anomaly or in the option skew of the underlying. Yeah, Dan's right. We could easily devote an entire episode to risk reversals. Perhaps we'll do that down the road because risk reversals are one of my favorite strategies. I still employ them all the time. And uh, there's a lot to get into in terms of where that terminology actually comes from and what John was just talking about with the skew aspects of risk reversal. So perhaps this might be a, a meaty topic for a, another show to really dive into. But for the quick answer to your uh, question there, Alex K., of course, Dan is right. That is what people traditionally in the retail sense look at as a collar where you're long stock and then you buy puts as a hedge and then sell a call, a call to offset the price of that hedge. That option component, the buying the put, the selling the call, that is a, a bearish risk reversal. You're buying a put, selling a call, putting on a bearish position that happens to offset your long stock position in that sense. So it's termed a collar, but you could do it by itself. Too. You don't need the stock component. You can just, if you're bearish on a stock, you want a cheap way to spec on some downside movement as opposed to buying an at the money put. Maybe you buy an out of the money put and then you sell an out of the money call against it. Now you have a cheaper way to, uh, uh, to do that. Remember, of course, you have that naked call position, so there is a margin component you're going to be tying up with some opportunity costs, but it is an interesting way to do it. A lot of people like to take the opposite side of that approach who fall into some of the premium selling side of the fence is that they look to sell the out-of-the-money put and buy the out-of-the-money call, which allows them, of course, to sell, put on a bullish risk reversal, a bullish position in the underlying. And the reason I say a lot of people like to do that is because so much of the investing public does the opposite. They do that collar approach. They're buying the put the hedge, they're selling the call to uh, to offset the price of that put. So what you have is that skew effect. Puts are relatively more expensive from a volatility perspective. Calls are relatively cheaper. So if you're taking the opposite approach, you're selling the put out of the money put, buying the out of the money call, you're, you're getting the benefit of that. You're buying a cheap call, you're selling an expensive put, you're getting better bang for your buck. And it is a great way to express a bullish sentiment on the underlying rather than just going out and buying the stock or buying an at-the-money call or an at-the-money call spread, something like that. This might be an interesting, more nuanced approach for you to do that. I recommend all of our listeners who do like to go out and buy stock uh, to perhaps investigate the bullish risk reversal instead. It might be an interesting way for you to take and establish that bullish position. And I think with that, it's a good note for us to wrap up the mail call segment Perhaps if you're interested in this topic or perhaps even what we hit upon with the other question from Theodore, the volatility ETFs and things like that, those are both fertile grounds for future episodes. I think we'll revisit those in episodes to come, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but before we go, as always, I'd like to check in with my cohorts here on the Options Boot Camp program to see what they have cooking in their respective necks of the woods that may interest you, the Options Boot Camp listener. Let's start with you, Dan. Uh, you've been hitting like a madman about new stuff coming, new stuff coming, new stuff coming. Can you please finally tell our listeners what the heck is cooking with you over there at Market Taker Mentor? Today is the day I've been threatening this day for seemingly months. I think it has been months, actually. Um, I have a brand new class at Market Taker, and it's really great. It kind of came about because people asked me for it. It is a futures options group coaching class it's an awesome class it's every single day and from 10 15 to 11 15 one hour every day you go over the futures markets and get trade ideas from our new head coach i just hired a new coach dave rogers and i am the luckiest options educator in the world to have dave with me Dave has been in the business for 25 years. He traded down the floor of the uh, CME. He stood next to me and Ford for a number of years. You know, he was, and he was a huge, huge upstairs trader for one of the gas companies. So he's about the best guy in the world uh, to have as a guide every day 
giving you trade ideas and, and teaching you what's going on in the futures market right now. So I'm really super duper excited about that. So um, anybody has any questions, find us at uh, markettaker.com or email, e- email us admin at markettaker.com. Yeah, very exciting stuff. A lot of love going into the futures options realm these days. We are, of course, the next show on the docket we we have here for the Options Insider Radio Network is a futures options program. So there is a lot of interest in that area. And of course, I know you're partnering with our friends over at RCM Asset Management for this this class. We like those guys as well. They are, of course, on a lot of our other programs. So nice to see the synergy unfolding here in the options space. Good guys working with good guys to provide quality education for you, the listener of this fine program. And of course, last but not least, John, you've been talking about the various upgrades and tweaks you've been making over there at SogoTrade.com. I'll give our listeners a tease, a hint of what's going on over there in the land of SogoTrade.com. Uh, next week, we have our famous optimizer coming out that's been in the works for about two years. I've been working on it, testing it, and we're in the final stages. I actually have it in a test account, a staging account, and this basically, as the name implies, it just optimizes positions and pending orders, option orders, and it gives a more optimal margin calculation for our customers. We were getting uh, some customers that were, were coming to issues uh, with margin, not necessarily on our part, but on a clearing firm. So we tried to sync it up and really tried to give them the, the, the best optimization so they didn't have any more margin calls. So we're very excited about that. And uh, we also have um, a new advanced screener that you can look at for free if you just go to our website and there's a more robust version if you're a customer, but you can check that out. And of course, as always, uh, we have the Sogo Trade blog under the education banner and the Twitter is Sogo Trade Option. So we're very excited about the summer and many more things in the pipeline also to be announced. And just to clarify then for our listeners, if they're already a Sogo Trade customer, they're going to get access to this optimizer already. They don't need to do anything else, right? No, we're gonna we're gonna roll it out, and I think we have some customers that have you know talking to me specifically. So I would reach out to them first, and maybe we might do a soft launch. Um, but eventually, we're gonna roll it out to everybody. It's just gonna basically give you uh, more robust. So even some of the other option platforms, they may have the basic um, you know vertical call spreads and butterflies and stuff optimized, but they don't have some of the optimization that a trader may expect, like if, if you're long calls and you sell stock, I think, you know, things like that where, where the, the, the basic retail platforms don't have it, we're going to have now. So it's just going to be fair for our customers. It's, it's like a, a watered down version of portfolio margin to some extent. It's, it's, it's between portfolio margining and the basic uh, margin. So there you go. If you're already a customer of Sogo Trade, you'll have access to that. If you're not a customer of Sogo Trade and you're listening to the show, what the heck are you doing? Get on over there to SogoTrade.com. Sign up for an account. Let them know you can't. You learned about it from Options Boot Camp uh, so that they know that you guys are responding in droves. And if you want to listen to the show while you're over there at SogoTrade.com, just click on the Education tab at the top of the page. Then click on the Sogo blog. It is kind of buried in there. But in that Sogo Trade blog, you will see links to all the recent episodes of this show, some of the uh, show notes so you can see what the shows are about. You can stream them. You can download them right from there. So while you're logged into the Sogo Trade site, while you're checking out your trades and everything else in your accounts, you can listen to episodes of this fine program. If you want to go back and review a topic we discussed on a previous episode or something like that, it's easy to find right there on the Sogo Trade website. Well, Mark, one more thing. We, we have for the podcast – we have a big banner up, so which we've had from day one, and so the customers can click on either the uh, the blog, as you said, or the banner. There's a podcast uh, specific banner; they can click on that also. All right, and unfortunately, that's going to do it for us here on the Options Bootcamp program. Of course, we want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this program and writing in with such great questions. Keep them coming, and we'll see you next time right here on Options Bootcamp. Options Bootcamp is brought to you by SogoTrade, an extraordinary value in online trading.
Why pay more for the same trade when SoGo Trade can deliver for less? Options commissions are just $5 per ticket and 50 cents per contract, and just $3 for stock at ETF trades. Open a new account today and receive 100 free trades. Visit www.sogotrade.com to learn more about all our free trading tools, educational resources, and other resources available to you to enhance your trading experience. Remember, options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. For more information, please read the characteristics and risks of standardized options available at www.sogotrade.com. Options Boot Camp is produced by the Options Insider, Inc. All rights reserved. of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.